Thank you, Sue. And welcome. Welcome to a time to remember and celebrate Milton Stowe's and our Lord and Savior who gave him to us. I'm Chaplain Dave Strapman. Blessed to be with you here today. We begin. We've been claimed through holy baptism in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn today, Lord, take my hand. Psalm 41, verses 1 to 3. <coughs> Happy are those who are concerned for the poor. The Lord will help them when they are in trouble. The Lord will protect them and preserve their lives. He will make them happy in the land. He will not abandon them to the power of their enemies. The Lord will help them when they are sick and will restore them to health. Thank you. 
separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the righteous people at his right and the others at his left. Then the king will say to the people on his right, Come, you that are blessed by my father, come and possess the kingdom which has been prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. I was hungry, and you fed me. Thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you received me in your homes. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. In prison, and you visited me. The righteous will then answer him, When, Lord, did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty or give you a drink? When did we ever see you a stranger and welcome you into our homes or naked and clothe you? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least important of these followers of mine, you did it for me. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Our hymn, Let All Who Captive Lie in Chains of Any Kind.
May the Lord smile upon each and every one of you, and may he keep you and hold you in his grace. Amen. Thanks be to God for the gift of Milton Edward Stowe's, because I'm guessing that practically everyone in this sanctuary has been blessed in some way, some shape or form, by Milton. He was used of God to touch so many lives, a devoted husband for 70 years, committed father, faithful parish pastor, steadfast chaplain to the poor and confined, the elderly, the brokenhearted, inmates' families, the forgotten, dedicated servant with the Lutheran Mission Association, caring neighbor here at Breeze Park. And throughout all of those different vocations and of ones which I had no, I'm not even aware of, Milton lived a life of compassion. He brought this bright ray of hope, this bright ray of light into this old world that just kind of limps along in despair and hopelessness, an instrument of grace. To borrow from today's closing hymn, a channel of God's peace. Now, is that to say that Milton never missed a beat, or that he never sinned? Well, of course not. Like each and every one of us, he had his own particular shortcomings, his own regrets and sins. We all do. We all need the forgiveness of Jesus, and Milton understood that. He understood that it is by grace we have been saved through faith, not by anything of our own, but by a gift from God. As our epistle said, Milton said, knew that we could never rightfully claim the credit. And yet, at the same time, our Lord certainly got a lot of mileage out of him. He certainly utilized his redeemed child in a powerful and, yes, beautiful way. As Milton cared for his family, as he worked toward justice, as he tended his flocks, there was this characteristic that stood out, at least stood out to me, and I'm sure some of you, the way in which he cared and worked and tended. What distinguished him from many, many people is the manner in which he did what he did. It was with dignity towards people. For just a moment, to kind of consider how it's possible to do things like serving and working and tending for others, but to carry out those functions apart from a sense of mercy, apart from dignity, apart from heartfelt agape love. I mean, clearly a person could outwardly perform those kind of beneficial acts without caring from the inside out. Not to offend anyone, but to make a comparison, perhaps it might be like a physician who, who demonstrates great technical skill, great clinical skill, and, 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 but doesn't feel any empathy, no, no compassion towards human beings who hurt. So it is possible to carry out, call it needful functions, but neglecting the heart and the soul of the person they're attempting to help. But Milton did both. Both. He, he provided care for people while caring about people. And friends, that kind of agape, loving care, it only comes from one place. It only comes from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's demonstrated through our Lord Jesus Christ. But I suspect that Milton did more than merely imitate Jesus. Please don't misunderstand. Of course, Milton followed the example of Christ. But for Milton, Jesus was more than just an exemplary teacher. So, for instance, if someone were to say, now this is the example that Jesus provides us, it's the right way to do things, now you just do what Jesus did. That might work for a little while, but it only goes so far. It's only partially effective to have some great role model and then to be told just to act in the same way as the role model. Kind of a limited motivation. But for Milton Stowe's, Christ was more than an example to follow. He was that, but more than that, Christ was also Milton's Savior, who loved him so much that he died and rose again for him. Listen to this excerpt from Milton's favorite sermon. He was preaching a message back in 1986, and it was based upon today's epistle reading. Milton had been preaching about how we've been saved by God's grace through faith, 
and how that's a gift of God, not by anything we've done. And then he went on to verse 10. We are God's work of art, created in Christ Jesus to live the good life as from the beginning he had meant us to live it. So our salvation being more than something we just kind of keep privately to ourselves, more than just kind of strictly benefiting our own eternal destiny, he also understood that our Savior intends our redemption to, to go out, to, to extend out to other human beings. To kind of put it theologically, we've been saved by God's gift of justification in order that we live out faithful lives of God's sanctification. Milton said in his sermon, through Jesus Christ, God has saved us and made us into his likeness, redeemed children of God. He said, it's God's gift to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And he, and he said, that's what makes us worthwhile people, children of God, God's work of art. He made the point that, yes, on one hand, we are God's creation, not our own artwork. And then he explained how being God's artwork is now evidenced by our lives, by our actions, not just our theological beliefs, more than a doctrinal truth, but also a way of life. And because of that, Milton said, because of that, we reach out not just to one another, but also to others in need, to others who may not be able to do something for you in return. He said, that's what the gospel reading, Matthew 25, is all about. Jesus bids us to also show our faith by reaching out to the sick, the hungry, the thirsty, those in prison. The love of our Savior informs our love. Towards the end of Milton's sermon, he tied the pieces together. He said, we who have been saved by grace, healed through faith in Jesus Christ, born anew by baptism into God's family, we are called as God's work of art to demonstrate and reflect his creative skills by living the good life of love, which he intends us to live. So we thank God. We thank God for his artwork displayed through Milton at Stowe's. We thank God for that care that he demonstrated, his love, his devotion, service, and compassion. We thank God for the way, the manner in which Milton demonstrated those qualities, all with this wonderful, beautiful sense of dignity. I pray that you remember. And we thank God for Milton's Savior, his Savior Jesus, the one who informs it all, the one who redeemed Milton by his precious blood, so that Milton would be his blessed work of all. Where we always remember Milton's Savior. At the risk of borrowing too much from Milton's sermon, and hopefully you don't think of a man he didn't even write his own sermon. At the risk of borrowing too much, I'd like to leave you with the closing sentence that he wrote back in 1986. Milton said, How may God's Spirit inspire and empower us? to become ever more alive in Christ, active in good works, in being God's work of art. Amen to that. And the peace of God that does surpass all understanding, we keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.
several different prayer petitions, and at the end of each of the petitions, I'll end with the words, Lord, in your mercy. And if you'd like, I invite you to respond with the words, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your chosen people together into one communion in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to newness of life, and so pass with Jesus through the gates of death and the grave to our joyful resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, grant to the family of Milton and to all who mourn comfort through their grief and assure confidence in your loving care that casting all of our sorrow upon you, we may know the consolation of your love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, help us, we pray, in the midst of things which we cannot understand, to believe and find comfort in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, look graciously upon those who mourn the death of our beloved brother, husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and bring them to a joyous and blessed reunion in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we thank you that you have given Milton a long life of grace. And we pray that you would grant we too may die in peace and receive the crown of everlasting glory. Lord, we thank you for Milton, who has faithfully shepherded your flock here on earth. Grant that we too would be found faithful unto death and receive that crown. Lord, in your mercy. In God of grace, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to bring life and immortality to light. We thank you that by our Savior's death, he has destroyed the power of death, and by his resurrection, he has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Strengthen us in the confidence that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, will be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. And we are bold to pray the prayer of our, our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
an opportunity for, for several loved ones to come up and share some words and, and to honor Milton. Good morning, everyone. I think most of you know that I'm Miriam Stowe's uh, third child of Milton and Carol. Not the oldest, not the youngest, and not the only boy. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to start out by asking everybody to give me a big smile and pretend Dad was here smiling back at you, but then I realized we all had our masks on, so I can see your smiles. As many of you know, I left my job as a trial attorney, actually a public defender, to come back to St. Louis to be my dad's caregiver, and this is Definitely the hardest closing statement I ever had to write. Or it did feel like I was writing a closing statement because it was pretty late at night when I was actually doing it. Um, and I will give this my best shot and make it short because, as I'm sure you can imagine, I'm pretty tired right now. Uh, hopefully, I'll get through without crying because I do have my hands. I just want to uh, first thank Pastor Dave for his kindness, his support, all of his help with putting this service together and with being our officiant today. Uh, not, not the least of which was stepping in and playing the uh, Hazel Joy of Man's Desiring after Stephen and Joanne's flight, um, as I mentioned, was canceled from San Diego yesterday. Uh, I won't go into the details, but we found out about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so once again, thanks Southwest. Mm -hmm. I should also mention that we are missing my niece, uh, Rachel, uh, Carolyn, and Bob's oldest, and the first grandchild, uh, due to a canceled flight, Southwest flight from Tampa. So both ends of the country weren't working so well yesterday. I know they were watching this service, so I want to tell you that we love you and miss you, and we will see you next year. I also want to thank Sue Sturtz for saving the day by way of my cousin Rachel Bursman uh, by offering to <laughs> play for dad's service at the last minute. Um, and thank you, Rachel, for the bonus of adding your beautiful voice to our hymns and leading us with the hymns. Um, thank you all for coming today, for joining us virtually, uh, to remember and honor my dad. Uh, to Nancy and Karen, my cousins, uh, for bringing your mom, my dear Aunt Shirley, um, all the way, who was married to my dad's oldest brother, Leonard Stos. Uh, they came all the way from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, to Carolyn and Bob, and her younger daughter, Elisa, and her two girls, Peyton and Mila, uh, for driving here from Kentucky. Thankfully, Southwest does not fly to Lexington. <laughs> um, and thank you to all the family and friends who supported Mom and me over the past four years. Uh, with the biggest shout outs to my sisters, Carolyn and Jennifer, and my brother, Stephen, I could not have done what I did without them. <coughs> to the residents and staff of Reeves Park, thank you for your friendship, kindness, and encouragement. Uh, I know a lot of you have done some caregiving in your own lives, and it was very helpful to have uh, lots of kind words on almost on a daily basis. Most of all, I want to thank my mom for being the amazing caregiver that you are. <laughs> and for being the best co-caregiver I could ever ask for. I'm sure my dad would agree. <laughs> As most of you know, dad spent um, the last years of his life battling Parkinson's disease. And no one will ever say that caregiving was the easiest thing they ever did. 
but it's a whole lot easier when the person you're caring for is, is as loving and gracious as my dad was. Throughout his entire life, he was a compassionate, selfless, empathetic man who always put the feelings and needs of others first, especially when it came to his family. If I had to pick one phrase to describe how he lived his life, it would be, he walked the walk. He was also a lot of fun to hang out with. So anybody who had the pleasure of being at family functions or just being out and about with him knows how much fun he was with his big contagious laugh. I recently watched that amazing World Cup final without him by my side. We had just recently lost him. And I really missed my sports watching buddy. Cardinals, the Blues, tennis, and soccer. I could easily gush about my dad for another hour, but I know he would be mortified by that. So I will end with a quote. Maya Angelou said, People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. My dad made everyone around him feel good. And while our lives will never be the same without him, I plan to honor his memory by working a little harder to treat everyone with kindness and respect by loving my friends and family just a little bit more, and by loving and forgiving myself for my own shortcomings. Because that's how my dad lived his life. So rest in peace, my dear sweet dad. Your memory will live on in our hearts and minds forever. I'm gonna turn it over to my older sister, Carolyn. She would have to say her older sister. <laughs> <laughs> and I am the oldest. Um, so I'll try not to say any of the same things that Miriam just did because we didn't share our uh, what we wanted to say. But I do want to take a few minutes to acknowledge Miriam. For the past four years, as most of you know, she has been Dad's primary caregiver. This gave my parents the ability to spend these same years together in their Breeze Park, Breeze Park apartment. Miriam has had a number of careers over her short life and gives 100% of herself. She became my, our dad's sports crunching companion, personal trainer and coach, dinner chef, patient advocate and documenter, backyard gardener, video call enabler, and many more. Thanks to Miriam and our mom, my dad was able to spend his last few years surrounded by tender, loving care which is what he said not very long ago when asked what he wanted, he said TLC. My sister Jen was a big in-town support, providing dis delicious meals, transportation to doctor's appointments, social visits, and more. My brother Steve, who as you know is in California, um, at first together uh, with myself would um, uh, provide, uh, we kind of tag teamed respite care um, while Miriam would take some uh, trips away. And then this past year we came together so that he could be my muscle when I could no longer do the transfers by myself from my dad. And thanks to both my mom and dad, we grew up in tender loving care. And for that, we are forever grateful. Now, just as a side note, uh, some of us have not had that big cathartic cry yet, and I'm just hoping we get through 
today without it. <laughs> um, so as we come to the end of the service, I'd like to share a quote by Howard Thurman. He was born in 1899 in Daytona Beach, Florida. He was an author, philosopher, theologian, mystic, educator, and civil rights leader. He played a role in many of the social justice movements in the 20th century. A few years ago, I came across the following quote and subsequently found out it was hanging on my parents' wall. My dad's secretary had written it out in 1975 and gifted it to him. It ties in well with the gospel reading we heard today and the hymn, the last hymn we just sang together. It is particularly appropriate this time of year and to me encapsulates the mission of my dad's work. May we all do what we can to continue this legacy. The work of Christmas. When the song of the angels is still, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people, to make music in the heart. And now, our sister Jennifer will sing a song for us. It was just a few years ago that she started channeling songs, and our mom's artwork was her muse. You can follow along with the lyrics in the bulletin.
beautiful gender. Thank you, Carolyn and Miriam. And I know I'm echoing what people have said before. Thanks uh, for so many people with music and bulletins. Thank you, Ted and Mickey, for the audio visual, uh, for putting all these things together to, to make it happen. Now receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God.